In this series of Bible studies, we have been studying about the greatest imitator of Jesus Christ, which is the devil. And so far, we have seen how the devil imitates Jesus Christ as a king, how the devil imitates Jesus Christ as God, how the devil imitates Jesus Christ as light. Today, we are going to look at how the devil imitates the Trinity of God. So we are going to look at the counterfeit Trinity. The counterfeit trinity, which uh, is also called the unholy or satanic trinity. Whereas God is uh, the holy trinity, the Godhead is called the holy trinity in theological terms. The devil's trinity or the counterfeit trinity is the unholy or the satanic trinity. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. 1 John chapter 5 verse 7 <clears throat> For there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. Now I know that most Christians do not even know that this verse has been taken away from their Bibles. There are some Christians who think that this verse should not be there in the Bible as it is found in the King James Bible and the reason why they believe that 1 John 5 7 does not belong in the King James Bible is pure ignorance of history and manuscript evidence. So that is the problem. But 1 John 5 7 clearly teaches us that there are three that bear witness in heaven. That is the Father, which is God the Father, and then you have the Word and the Spirit. And these three are one. Remember that. That the Bible very clearly says that the Father, the Word and the Spirit are one. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost. The King James Bible here uses the word Holy Ghost. But for us to uh, understand it in a more simple way, I've just put it as Spirit. Now look at what the Bible says about this satanic trinity. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16 and we'll read verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So you have imitating the Holy Trinity or the Godhead. In the false trinity you have the dragon and you have the beast and the false prophet this is the satanic trinity the very fact that the devil tries to imitate god and in doing so he shows himself to be a trinity is reason enough for us to believe i would say that god is a trinity there are christians who do not believe this so-called christians and we just cannot understand how it is that they can read the bible and still come out with this conclusion that there is no such thing as a Godhead with three persons in it. But the Bible unequivocally teaches God in three persons, co-equal, co-eternal and uh, the whole theological system that has been set up on this doctrine is true and it is something that we as Christians should believe. So here is God. The Godhead is a trinity, the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost. And the unholy trinity imitates the true trinity, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. But there is much more to this than just that. Not only does the devil imitate God, the trinity, but the devil also has deceived people from the beginning of time to believe in a false trinity. And I would like to take you briefly through history to show you what I mean. All ancient religions have their source in Babylon. Babel is the place after the flood where all the known religions of this world have come from. Every ancient religion, the Egyptian religion, the Indian religion, the Greek religion, the Roman religion, the Phoenician religion, or the Icelandic or the Gothic or any other place in Europe, all these uh, religions have their roots in Babylon 
and that must be noted down and understood if you would ever understand uh, why world religions believe what they believe today. Look at Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 7. Jeremiah 51 verse 7. Babylon had been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. So it says here that Babylon had been a golden cup. Babylon always is uh, symbolized by a golden cup. And it says that Babylon had made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. This is an indication of how it was Babylon that corrupted all mankind after the flood and before God scattered them throughout the world uh, at the time of uh, the Tower of Babel and the confusion of tongues. Before that, it was Babylon which corrupted mankind with false understanding of the one true living God. Look at Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. I will read Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of uh, blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This passage clearly teaches us that the mother of all abominations of the earth, the mother of all harlots, spiritual harlotry, that is going away astray from the one true living God, was initiated by none else than this great whore that sitteth upon many waters, that is Babylon. Of course, in the book of Revelation, it is... Uh, signifying or symbolizing the Roman Catholic Church which is Babylon mystery Babylon the Great the reason why I say that is not just because uh, we can clearly see in the entire chapter that Rome is being mentioned there and the woman there certainly is the Roman Catholic Church but also because the Roman Catholic Church has its roots in Babylon Roman Catholicism is mystery Babylonian religion in a new garb that's all all their practices all their beliefs are almost the same as those to be found in the ancient Babylonian mystery religion some people think well Islam you know what about Islam Islam came in the seventh century does it also have its roots in ancient Babylon yes it does because Islam is nothing but a continuation of the paganism that existed before Muhammad and that paganism which was uh, there in Arabia in those days was nothing but uh, an offshoot of the mystery Babylonian religion from ancient times, from the times of Nimrod. If you understand this, a lot of other things will become clear. But the thing that I want you to make note of here is that the source of all false religions in this world is Babylon. It will help you a lot if you take a concordance and look up the word Babylon throughout the Bible and take out some of the most important passages and study it. And you will see what uh, God has said about this place, Babylon, and what role it uh, is going to play in the future in Bible prophecy. It's a very edifying study, very eye-opening study. Babylon, Assyria, Nimrod, all these things are things that you can study, not just to satisfy your curiosity about the origin of religions but also because they have a bearing on future coming events in this world after the church is raptured. So the source of all harlotry, spiritual harlotry and abominations in this world is Babylon. Babylon is the mother. No doubt the Roman Catholic Church calls itself the mother church because it comes from Babylon. 
once you understand this, you can also see how Satan corrupted man's understanding of the one true God who is a unity. But in this unity, there is a plurality, one God in three persons. That is the true Trinity. The Bible teaches it, but Satan corrupted it. He is the greatest imitator of Jesus Christ. Not only does he, the, uh, the, the beast and the false prophet, imitate the Holy Trinity, but he has also taught humans to believe in a counterfeit Trinity. And that's what I'm trying to point out to you this, uh, today. Look at this. Babylon is the mother of all harlots, harlots and abominations. This is spiritual harlotry and the abominations are the practices and beliefs of the people that go against the true understanding of the one true living God. In ancient times, even before the flood, even in the days of Noah, during the days of the patriarchs, there was a very clear understanding among people of the one true living God. How is that possible, you say? Well, Adam lived in fellowship before his fall with the true God, the one true living God. And he would have transmitted his knowledge of this true God to his descendants. And Adam lived for a very long time, almost a thousand years, 900 change years. And he has seen many generations of his descendants. And he and his descendants would have passed on the, uh, the knowledge of the one true living God. Now we see that very clearly in uh, uh, Abel. How is it that Abel knew that he should take a blood sacrifice to offer to God? That's because Adam would have taught him to do so because he has seen God doing that for him when God clothed him and his wife with the skins of animals. That's another subject to consider and study. But Adam would have transmitted the knowledge of God that he had to his descendants. So there was a clear understanding that there is one true living God. But in the days of Noah, when the sons of God came down and mankind sinned with the sons of God, and there arose giants in the earth in those days, both those fallen angels who came in human form and married women and the children that were born to them were worshipped as gods because of their superhuman strength. Those were the original supermen that people worshipped in those days. Yes, they knew that there is one God up there in heaven, a supreme God. But they also believed in these sons of gods because they could see them and they could see their strength and their valor and their might. And they stood in awe of these great beings and said, these are gods and they bowed down and worshipped them. God wiped out the earth with the flood except the family of Noah. And after the flood, Noah's three sons uh, populated the earth again. And there were many people living in those days after the flood during the Tower of Babel. Some people say there were millions of people living in those days. Now, I'm not very sure about that, but there were quite a lot of people there because the three sons of Noah had children who in turn had children and the earth was once again getting filled up. The language was one, remember that. And in those days, the people rebelled against God once again. But what happened in those days after the flood? After the flood, once again, the people had a clear understanding that there is a one true living God. Because Noah and Shem and Japheth, even Ham perhaps, would have uh, passed on that knowledge of the one true God who wiped out the earth but saved them to their descendants. So they understood that there is a God, a supreme God. But Nimrod and his wife Semiramis, once again influenced by the fallen sons of God, started corrupting the knowledge of mankind about this one true God. And they started worshipping those fallen angels that lived in the days of Noah uh, and made images of them and started worshipping them. So they corrupted their knowledge of the one true God. But there indeed, certainly there was a clear understanding that there is a great God who is the creator of all things in all the religions of the earth. Look at this. In uh, ancient Egyptian religion, there was this clear understanding that there is an omnipotent deity who created all things. 
even in pagan Egypt with all their idols and temples and abominations, they knew that beyond all these things that they could see with their eyes up there in heaven is an omnipotent deity. In ancient Gothic religion, now this was Egyptian. In ancient Gothic religion, there was a belief in a supreme God who is the master of the universe. He was called the master of the universe. And in Egypt, he was called omnipotent. Then you have in the Icelandic, ancient Icelandic religion, the eternal author of all things that exist. In ancient uh, Icelandic religion, they believe that. That there is an eternal author of all things that exist. Then you have the ancient Indian religion. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about this. In the ancient Indian religion, in ancient India, there was a belief in a supreme being called Brahm. The name of the supreme god was Brahm. Sometimes he is also called Brahman. Now you should not get confused between Brahm and Brahma. Brahma is a representative, a visible representative of the invisible Brahm. And in the Vedas, Brahm is said to be the invisible God of whom there exists no image whatsoever. Now remember, Hinduism is one of the most ancient religions in the world. Perhaps as ancient or very close to the Babylonian mystery religions. And that's where Hinduism has come from. And in Hinduism, there is this belief in Brahm. Or sometimes he's called Brahman. But he is not Brahma, the creator God. He is a, a, a God who cannot be known. He's an impersonal being in their understanding. You see, there was an understanding among mankind, even after the flood, of the one true living God. But there is something very interesting about Brahm that I want you to understand. The Sanskrit word Brahm comes from the Hebrew word Rehem. The Hebrew word Rehem and this means the merciful one. The merciful one. Mankind knew that even after the fall, there was a uh, uh, supreme being who is an all-merciful being, who was merciful to fallen mankind. That understanding was there at the back of their minds even after the flood. And in the Arabic language, there is a similar word in Arabic. And that is Al-Rahman. Al-Rahman sounds very close to Brahman. Al-Rahman, which is again the compassionate or the merciful one, the possessor of vast mercy as he is called. So in the earliest days of the flood, there was this understanding of Brahm, the merciful one, the, the one who possesses vast mercy and uh, the compassionate one. Now, Brahm could also mean womb sometimes, signifying uh, that Brahm is the creator of all things from his womb. Like the Hindu god Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that Brahm is the womb from, uh, in which are conceived everything else that are conceived in other wombs. Now, that gets quite confusing sometimes, but the thing is, he is called a womb. And the reason for that is because he is the creator. But he's also called the womb sometimes because the womb or the bowels signify compassion and mercy. And who else could be a merciful one, a supreme being than the God of the Bible in whom all people in the world believed before their knowledge of him was completely corrupted by 
uh, the perversions that were introduced by the abominations that were introduced by Nimrod and his wife in the form of idol worship. So the thing that I'm trying to point out here is that in all these ancient religions, there is a clear belief in the one true living God, which uh, they despised, in a, you know, if I have to put it like that, if I may put it like that, they have rejected this knowledge of the one true living God and they followed after other gods and created their own religions. That that's how the devil counterfeited the one true living God. But that's not where I close. The point that I'm trying to make is that not only was there a belief in one God, as the Babylonians believed in, one God, they, one of the names of their gods was the one God. That was an ancient God in whom they all believed in, even in Babylon. They believed in this one God who is the creator of all things. But the fact is that in every ancient religion, there is also this belief that this one true God existed in three persons. In three persons. This is very great evidence for the doctrine of the Trinity. Not that we depend on pagan beliefs for our understanding of the Trinity, but... This is extra biblical proof that the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible is indeed a true doctrine which was understood by the people of this world in ancient times. So they believe that there is one God but they also believe that this one God existed in three persons especially in Babylon. Beginning with Babylon there was this understanding that the, Trinity, uh, that the one God existed in three persons. Now the Trinity in Babylon is depicted in this manner. This is Babylon. Here you have an old man. Alright, and I'll explain this. Here you have the head of an old man and half his body. But he's got two wings and the tail of a dove. And around his shoulder and arm is a ring, a circle. This is God. The old man is God. And this ring or circle around his hand is the seed. He is the seed or zero as he's called. In ancient Babylon, of course, you're not talking about the mathematical or the astronomical zero that... Uh, Aryabhatta and Brahmagupta spoke about in India in the early ages after Jesus Christ. But I'm talking about the zero that was already in existence in ancient Babylon. And right from the 3rd or 4th century BC, people in Babylon have been clearly writing about their belief in zero or the seed. Zero is where the Zoroastrian uh, religion comes from. Zoroaster has to do with zero. And zero is depicted as a circle uh, and it is a symbol of the seed. Where does this all come from? Well, it all, uh, it all comes from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. That's where this all comes from. So here you have God, you have the seed and the, the wings and the tail of the dove is the spirit. You see this. They believed in one God, but they also believed that this one God existed in three, per three persons. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is an accurate depiction of the Trinity. This is a pagan abomination of uh, the true God. So this is a pagan depiction of the one true God who exists in three persons. I'm not saying that this is exactly how it is, but look at how their true or good understanding degenerated into such abominable perversions. But the fact doesn't change. The fact is that God revealed himself in the Old Testament right from the beginning as one God in three persons. That is very clear. Even the patriarchs of Israel had a clear understanding of God in three persons. Remember? When Jacob spoke about how God blessed him, he speaks about three persons. Go back and check it out. 
the, even the pagans had this understanding of that one true living God who existed in three persons. So here you have God, the seed which is Jesus Christ and the spirit. Where did they get it from? They get it from Genesis 3.15 where God said the seed of the woman would crush or bruise the serpent's head. So people understood this truth. Some Christians say, oh, this is a Roman Catholic creation. The Trinity is not found in the Bible and uh, we have been deceived into believing it. No. Right from the beginning, in the Bible and in ancient religions, everybody understood this truth that God is one, one God in three persons. In many other countries also, there are such images of gods with three heads and three hands or six hands and all such things in all ancient religions. Even here in India, we have Brahma, the creator God, with three heads. He is a representative, a visible representative or a manifestation of the invisible Brahm or Rahim or the merciful one, the God of the Holy Scriptures. So there was a universal recognition of a trinity in all ancient religions. And that's uh, their understanding of this biblical trinity is of course a degenerated and perverted understanding of the truth. Now the true origin as I've said of all these things is that God revealed himself to Adam and Eve and uh, later on to their descendants as one God in three persons. And as the world was populated this great truth was corrupted and degenerated into polytheism and idolatry and you when you read Genesis you may be just reading chapters 1 to 12 very fast and you know you never sit down to think about the things that could have happened in those days compare them with the events that are recorded in history and you will see that the Bible is always true and all knowledge in this world is a corrupted form of the true knowledge that is found in the Holy Scriptures and that has been preserved to us today in the King James Bible. Now look at the biblical usage of the word Elohim. Elohim is a plural word. It means gods. Gods. So... When we say that, look, the Bible uses the Hebrew word Elohim for God because there are three persons in the Godhead, some people who do not believe in the Trinity would object and say, no, 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 Elohim is also the same word which the pagans used for their gods. That's true. The pagans used the word Elohim for their gods. Why is it that the Bible also uses the word Elohim for our God? It's very simple to understand. Firstly, you begin from a point of faith. You say the Bible is not wrong. You believe that, then God will honor that. And then you say, well, God is three persons. That's why the plural word Elohim is used. But why do the pagans use the word Elohim for their gods? It's because they also believed in a trinity. That is why. And their understanding of the Holy Trinity is a perverted, counterfeit understanding of the one true God who exists in three persons. Now, of course, this particular understanding of God as a Trinity, as God and the seed and the spirit, degenerated later on into a more perverted belief. That was that God is the first person of the Trinity but the third person of the Trinity the spirit incarnated himself as a human woman through whom the seed came into the world does that look familiar does that sound familiar to you yes that's the Roman Catholic Church that's where the Roman Catholic Church comes from from the Babylonian religion in ancient Babylon later on they believed that God was in heaven but the spirit incarnated himself as a woman, a, div a divine woman. And through the relationship that God had with that divine woman, the seed or zero came into this world. That's again a further perversion of the biblical truth of Jesus Christ who is God in the flesh. God manifest in the flesh. The incarnate son of God. 
That's the truth. But before that truth could come to pass, in reality, the devil imitated it, counterfeited it, and deceived the people. That's how the devil works, and you must understand it. If you don't, you also, in your own life, will be deceived by the devil. There are two more things that I would like to talk about in connection to this great counterfeit of the devil of the Holy Trinity. Now, having made this clear, that in ancient times itself, the devil deceived the people and uh, deceived them into believing in a counterfeit trinity. Just like God, who is a trinity, the devil counterfeited this great truth and made the ancient people believe uh, in a perverted form of this trinity so that they could never have a correct understanding of the one true living God. Now the Bible talks about some types of this satanic trinity that we have seen earlier. We have seen that the dragon, the beast and the false prophet together form the unholy or satanic trinity which imitates the holy trinity in the tribulation. But there are types of this satanic trinity in the Bible. Look at Numbers chapter 22 verse 41. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places of Baal that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. So you have Balak, you have Balaam, and you have Baal. Balak, of course, would be the Antichrist, and Balaam would be the false prophet, and Baal would be the dragon or the devil. Then in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, the Bible says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as, it had been, uh, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Edbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Again, here you have Ahab. You have Jezebel and you have Baal again, a counterfeit trinity. Ahab is like the Antichrist, a type of the Antichrist. Jezebel is a type of uh, the false prophet and you have Baal, a type of the devil. Okay, and uh, we have types of this uh, devilish or satanic counterfeit trinity. Two types at least. There are others also that you can find maybe if you study the Bible more. But uh, here you have two types of the satanic trinity. Now the intro this introduction, now you know the story that Ahab and Jezebel introduced Baal worship in Israel. Balak the Moabite uh, used Balaam the, the false prophet to destroy the children of Israel by offering sacrifices to Baal and by committing fornication. But when this Baal worship was introduced in Israel by Ahab and Jezebel, it was also accompanied by human sacrifice. Yes, that's right. Right there in the Bible you have it. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 28 verses 1 to 3. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burnt his children in the fire, after the abomination of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So right there in the days of the king Ahaz, you have introduction of Baal worship and the offering of their children to Balaam. And it's very sad, but it's true that even among God's people, this abominable practice that came from Babylon existed for some time. Look at Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 35. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. 
child sacrifice and human sacrifices accompany Baal worship or devil worship to put it in more simple words cannibalism is also connected to Baal worship in fact the English word cannibal comes from two words Khan Khan Baal Khan e Baal it means the priest of Baal now why does the English word come from these words the priests of Baal because the priests of Baal would not only offer human sacrifices but they engaged in cannibalism that is eating of human flesh so that's why the English word cannibal comes from these words which mean the priests of Baal so Baal worship or devil worship is always connected to human sacrifice and child sacrifice and pedophilia and all sorts of abominations even today yes Baal worship exists today in different forms it's given different names but the practices and beliefs and the abominations are those same old stinking rotten beliefs and practices that have come from Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth doesn't end there in the future in the coming terrible time called the great tribulation the Bible says that once again there will be Baal worship that is the devil worship under the Antichrist as well as cannibalism and human sacrifices look at what the Bible says in Isaiah 6 13 but yet in it shall be a tenth and it shall return and shall be eaten as a tail tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof he's talking about an inheritance that will return to Israel or Jerusalem and they will be eaten there literally by the Antichrist look at Micah chapter 3 and verse 3 who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron look at also Psalm 16 verse 4 their sorrow shall be multiplied that hasten after another God their drink offerings of blood will I not offer not take up their names into my lips Christians think all these things are uh, spiritualized or you need to spiritualize these things that they are all allegorical no they are prophetical doctrinal they're going to take place in the future in the tribulation when the Antichrist sits in the temple and says that he is God and that he should be worshipped his people would offer the Jews as human sacrifices their blood would be offered to him as a blood offering and their flesh would be eaten by the priests of Baal Kani Baal cannibalism is going to be there in the tribulation once again and that is the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel and the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 it is not the offering up of swine or it's not the devil or the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God it is the offering up of human sacrifices to the devil in the temple of God that is the abomination of desolation that's coming up now do you know where you find this today in a spiritual form you find it you find it in the Roman Catholic Church every Sunday morning when the Roman Catholic priest takes up that cup and that wafer and uh, he says this is the uh, the blood of Christ and the body of Christ literally they believe in transubstantiation that that wafer and that wine turns into the literal body and blood of Christ what are they doing they're eating and drinking the literal body and blood of Christ cannibalism Roman Catholic priests are Khan Ibal the priests of Baal who believe in cannibalism which will literally be fulfilled in the tribulation which is coming very soon after the rapture of the church so you here you have the greatest imitator of Jesus Christ who imitates the counter uh, or uh, the true Trinity and his Trinity is the counterfeit Trinity beware of this greatest imitator of Jesus Christ if you are an unsaved person you must understand that this great imitator of Jesus Christ has blinded your mind that you should not see the truth about the one true living God who exists in three persons the Holy Trinity and the second person of the Trinity the Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh who came down to this earth to die on the cross for your sins so that he can shed his blood for your sins as a payment 
for your sins. He paid the penalty for your sins. He took your place upon that cross. When he suffered, he bled and died on the cross. He did it for you in your place. You should have suffered because you're a sinner. And you should have died and gone to hell. But Jesus took the punishment for you. So that if you should receive him as your savior, you should be saved and be delivered from the punishment that God would render to every man who rejects Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died and rose up again from the dead. And if you trust him as your savior and in the blood atonement that he made upon the cross, you will be saved. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The Bible also says that, that the gift of God is eternal life. If you remain as a sinner, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God that he is willing to offer you today in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, is the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of all your sins. Your punishment was taken by him. And you need to trust him. Not your own righteousness, not your religion, not your good works, not your morals, not your wisdom, not your education. Nothing in this world can save you but Jesus Christ. If you trust him, the Bible says that he is the righteousness of God. And when you receive him as your savior or trust him as your savior, you get the righteousness of God. And you will be justified before God as a righteous person and be saved and become a child of God. And you will be delivered from this terrible person called the devil or Satan whose only motive is to destroy you forever. So that you may live in your sins and die in your sins and go to hell. But God sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to save you and you need to choose today whether you will trust in Jesus Christ and be saved or continue in your blindness and serve the devil, the great imitator of Jesus Christ. I hope and pray that you will trust Jesus Christ as your savior right now.